Hey everyone, welcome back to the channel. If you're new here, I'm Peter Elbaum. I'm a software engineer and I live in Raleigh, North Carolina. The video today is kind of a part two of the very first video I did in this style where I sat in front of the camera and that video was called Real Front End Interview Questions from Three Companies. It is by far my most watched video and I never expected that to be the case, but I guess it just turned out that a lot of people tend to search for that kind of thing. So I thought I would do a part two. So I'm back with 10 more real front end interview questions. And these are from a stage of an interview, which would be more like a whiteboarding session or an in-person. Just a couple of things I want to note. All these questions are either questions that I've been asked or have asked people in past jobs, not in my current job. And and I'll admit that in order to jog my memory, I did take some inspiration from 30 Seconds of Interviews, which I will link here and below. So you can check out 30 Seconds of Interviews for more example questions. It's super great and very helpful. This isn't a typical Silicon Valley interview. I've never had an interview like that with uh, whiteboarding algorithms. This is more the kind of interview that I've had in a normal tech company in my area and what I imagine are many other areas as well. So like I said, I've got 10 questions for you. The first five are more speaking, kind of conversationally oriented, and the last five are a little bit more whiteboard type questions where you would be solving an algorithm as it were, or just writing a function to accomplish a task. So our first question is, what is an iffy? And an iffy is an immediately invoked function expression. And the purpose behind using one is that an iffy creates a closure around the code that you're writing. So you're essentially just writing a function, which is then called. But the benefit of that is that it creates a closure so that you don't have to worry about naming conflicts or naming collisions if you are, for example, writing a library. So you see this really often in common JavaScript libraries where you will write things in an iffy so that way if someone is using that piece of code with some other code that happens to name a variable the same thing, you don't have to worry about conflicts. Question number two, what CSS frameworks have you used and are you comfortable rolling your own? Meaning, are you comfortable writing all your own CSS by hand? And so this is not so much a right and wrong question, but more of an experiential type question, but I think it is important as long as it's true to say that you're comfortable writing your own CSS. And so what this question is really getting at is, are you comfortable writing breakpoints on your own? Are you comfortable kind of coming up with your own UI kit and style guide, or are you overly reliant on something like a bootstrap or a material UI? Our third question is, what is the this keyword in JavaScript and what does it bind to? The basic definition that you'll find is that this is a property of an execution context, which basically just means a function. It's typically a reference to the object in which it is used. When it's not referencing an object, it references the global context, which basically just means the window of the browser. Something important to note here that would probably get you bonus points is that arrow functions in ES6 and beyond don't have their own this. They inherit it from the parent and so that is just something that is important to note and of course makes things like writing classes in react and stuff easier that is a brief answer and if you feel a little bit fuzzy of course it's worth looking this up and doing a little bit more reading the next question is what is the difference between absolute static and relative positioning in CSS. These are values of the position property in CSS and basically what they refer to is how the position is computed. So relative basically means relative to its normal position. So the top, bottom, left and right properties specify how offset the object or box or whatever it is, is from its normal position. Absolute means the item is taken out of the normal document flow and then attaches to whatever parent is relatively positioned. And if there is no uh, parent up the DOM tree that is relatively positioned, then it attaches to the window. And then static is just the default value. So nothing changes. Our fifth question is, what are the three parts of an HTTP request? And uh, I was actually asked this when I was giving an interview, uh, pretty interesting stuff, but the answer is number one, pre-flight. So there is a period before the request is sent. Uh, stage two, the request has been sent and the status is pending. And then stage three, the HTTP request comes back and it is either resolved or rejected. So that's it. 
So we're going to move on to our more whiteboard style questions. So like I said, these are all things I've been asked in the past or have asked people. So the first one is pretty simple. It is add two values. So write a function that adds two values. So you want to take uh, parameter A, parameter B, and then uh, add those and return them. Make sure to return them. Uh, so that is adding two values and returning the result. These are gonna get harder as we go. Okay, question seven is filter an array and take out all of the odd numbers, leave only the even ones. And so the way that we're going to do this is we're going to filter over an array and we're going to essentially do some modulo division, which gives you remainders. So if we divide modulo by two for each item in this array, we only want to leave the ones in which there is no remainder when you're dividing by two. So I'm going to go ahead and write that out here. Uh, so for each item, modulo division, and then we want the remainder to be zero. If so, it'll return true. And then we will be left with an array full of even numbers. Question eight is return an array of numbers, but instead of returning the array, you want to, for each number, return the value plus its index value. So Similar to what we did last time, we're going to map over an array of numbers, but you may or may not know that you also can use the index value along with the actual item itself. So the first argument in the callback is item. The next is its index value. So we will just return item plus index value for each one. And then as soon as we're done, we will return our array. Our next question is flatten a multi-dimensional array. And this function involves something called recursion, which is when a function calls itself. And so the way that we're going to start with this question is we're going to uh, reduce the initial array and reduce is a way of returning a single value from an array by calling a function against each element. And this function has an accumulator value and the current value. And so you're able to work with those. So the way that we're going to write this is for each item in the initial array, we're going to make a determination. Is this current value an array? If so, we're going to call the whole function again. And if not, we're simply going to return the value and concat it, which is a way of adding it to the accumulator value. And then at the end, the way you end up doing it, you return just a single array with all the values in it. So that is flatten a multi-dimensional array. Our last question is to shuffle a list of integers in an array, and this could work with anything. This is a slight variation on a question that I was asked in real life, but I was asked to implement it kind of in theory, and it, it was a little bit different. It had to do with matching people up for a white elephant, but this is the closest approximation I thought made sense for this video. So the standard algorithm for shuffling an array is called Fisher Yates. So I'm going to take you through an implementation of that right now. So the way you write that is that you essentially measure where you are in the array. So you start at the end and work your way backwards. And for each one, you kind of get the current index value based on where you are you generate a random number based on that value so that way the random number can't be greater than that value and you're able to ensure that you're working your way from right to left and so then with the random number you essentially assign the current index a temporary value so that you can store it there while you're mutating the original one you then mutate the current index and you give it the random index's value you then give the random index's value the temporary stored value which was the value of the original index and you continue to move through the array doing this as long as the current index isn't zero which means that there are still numbers left to be assigned and so that's pretty much it that is how you you would shuffle an array of integers using Fisher Yates. So that's it guys, that's 10 real front end interview questions from the whiteboard kind of stage of an interview. Uh, I hope you found these helpful. If you did, feel free to like and subscribe and I will see you in the next one. Thanks.